Welcome, and thank you for taking a moment to focus in on the things of God. Maybe you're going through a tough time in your life. Maybe there are things going on that you just don't feel like you can get out of. Well, maybe you're up against the wrong thing. Maybe you feel like you're up against your problems, but you're up against something much bigger. We're going to read a passage today in Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 15, that I think will help us understand the things that we actually fight a lot of times in this world. So starting in verse 15, it says, See to it that none of you fall short of the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. And afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded, that even uh, if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who wanted them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. And therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reference and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. I read a story some time ago about a kid in college. He wasn't doing all that great. And so he texted his mom and said, flunked out, prepare dad. And his mom texted him back not too long after that and said, Dad's prepared. Prepare yourself. <laughs> you know, it's strange to me how people think they need to prepare God for their failures. They'll talk to God about how the circumstances in their lives are, are keeping them from being the people that they know God wants them to be. But too often, we don't see that our problems are not actually the trouble we're having. We're not up against our problems. We're up against God. And maybe the reason we know so little about God is because we make the decision to tune him out. We're going after things that have no long lasting value. And the majority of those things are goals that we made, not the goals that God had for us. Whenever you try and choose your own destiny and set up your own priorities, sooner or later, you will come up against God. And this passage in Hebrews is warning us uh, against doing things, and it tells us what to avoid. And the first and one of the biggest things, we need to avoid worshiping things that are temporary. You know, even though this passage is uh, talking to Christians who aren't staying true to Christ in the face of their persecutions, the message today is still the same. Nothing will destroy spiritual character like worshiping things. Nothing can come before God in our lives. And this is such a tough one because that means if you think of the person you love most in this world and think of all that you would do for that person at the drop of a hat, no one and no thing can ever come before God. And they use Esau as an example here because it says for a single meal, he sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Now, <laughs> As a person who enjoys a good meal, this still mystifies me. And I can remember even as a child 
being stumped by this uh, story of Esau. Why would anybody give up all of those things for a bowl of stew? And of course, over time, I've come to realize that Esau shows us how tied up we get in having the things we want right now. And that should be easy for most people to understand today because that's the world we're living in. And as far as food goes, you can get just about any kind of food you want. Uh, from any culture, Mexican, Chinese, Thai, Italian, whatever. And you can have it in a few minutes, maybe even have it delivered to your house. If you're online and you click a link and nothing happens for 30 seconds, that feels like an eternity. With Esau, the birthright that he forfeited involved the first rank in the family. It involved a double share of the inheritance. It involved the privilege of being able to offer sacrifices and lead worship after the death of his father. But more than that, it involved a place among, in the bigger picture, the patriarchs. Esau would have been listed among the patriarchs, the guys that God used to fulfill his promises to Abraham. And what Esau did is still a warning to us against a worldly spirit. You might get what you want in the moment, but afterwards you're left with nothing. In verse 17 we read, it says, Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. Yeah, he had a good bowl of stew, <laughs> and it was the most expensive bowl of stew anybody ever bought. But Esau found himself in a position that a lot of us are in. He couldn't undo what he'd done. He made a deal. And the sad thing is that a lot of folks, just like Esau, he wasn't sad because he hurt God. He was sad because he couldn't reverse what he'd done, because he could have gotten way more stuff the other way. And now Esau is an example of how we can't go into the past and fix all of those mistakes that we made. So we need to be careful about focusing this life on things that are temporary. But obviously a second thing we'd want to avoid is ignoring Jesus. When we ignore Jesus and the gospel, we're going to come up against God really quickly. In verse 22, the writer of Hebrews reminded the readers that they were at Mount Zion. That was the highest elevation in Jerusalem. Zion had come to represent God's heavenly city the assembly of God's people, and it had also come to represent the church itself. So that sort of emphasizes the fact that as Christians, we're confronted with the church as well as Christ. The writer of Hebrews made this comparison between Mount Sinai and God's final revelation in Jesus Christ. The experience at Mount Zion, as he describes it, is one with thundering and quaking, and since God's presence was on the mountain, the people were warned not to touch it or they would die. And in fact, even today, uh, people will not touch it. Even though God was speaking at Sinai, in verse 25 that we read, you can see how much more urgent it is to listen to Jesus. And you, make sh you need to make sure it says that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? The final word has been spoken in Jesus Christ. The last covenant has been made. In the Old Testament, covenants were made by sprinkling the blood of animals. The last covenant was made by the blood of Jesus Christ. So the reference here to Abel's blood uh, means that Abel's murder is still a reminder of how uh, sinful we are when we're left to our own judgments and our own devices. But the blood of Jesus Christ shows us that God's offer of forgiveness and new life is still there. and We don't want to ignore that. But then there's a final thing we need to avoid. We need to avoid cheapening the eternal. As Christians, we're called to make some high-risk investments in the following God's will. And it has to be more than just a good feeling that we have about things. We're literally turning our lives over to the advancement of the kingdom of God. God's kingdom can't be destroyed. But while we're still on earth, it also cannot be seen. 
So by faith, as this writer had talked about earlier in chapter 11, we're committing our lives to the eternal. In verse 28 we read, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and with awe. Even though we can't see what God's kingdom will be, there is a visible instrument of that kingdom that people can see while they're on earth, and that's the church. And that means you cannot separate loyalty to God from faithful activity in the church. It's very important. Because not only are we confronted by Christ, we're also confronted by the calling we have to serve in the church. When the Israelites, for example, decided not to go into the promised land, they were disobeying God. Their destiny was in Canaan, so they couldn't do what God wanted them to do while they were sitting in the wilderness. That's why so many of them died while they were in the wilderness. And verse 26 is referring to a verse in Haggai, chapter 2, verse 6, when it says, At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will not shake only the earth, but also the heavens. And that word that's translated for us as shake, it refers to the trembling of an earthquake. In fact, it's a word in, in the Hebrew that we also get our word seismograph from to measure earthquakes. And that phrase that's used once more, it, it comes from a word that means once and for all. So verse 27 is saying that basically everything that can be shaken, and that is the created things, will be shaken. And the only thing that will be left will be the things of God that cannot be shaken. This is something you see in Hebrews in chapter 1 and verses 11 and 12, where it says, they will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment they will be changed, but you remain the same and your years will never end. You know what it comes down to is that it is a challenge to genuinely trust God because the things that are temporary are easy to see. The things that are eternal are largely invisible to us while we're on earth. And why God's chosen to do that, I don't really know. Maybe it's because it's the only way we can actually have freedom of choice. I mean, there would be no problem choosing eternal things if everything were visible. We would obviously choose the eternal over the temporary. But the facts are laid out for us in the Bible, and we have the freedom to choose those facts or to reject those facts. The bottom line is we can either choose to hold on to God and eternal things, or we can choose to hold on to the temporary things of this world. We just need to understand that when we choose those temporary things, we're also taking a stand against God. And I think it's obvious to say that's something we don't want to do. And I would assume that it's something you don't want to do. So why not today make the decision to make God the focus of your life. And if you've never received him as Lord and Savior, to take that step to receive him today. I'm going to have a prayer with you. And while we pray, why not be open to the things of God as he speaks to your heart? Let's pray together. Lord, again, we thank you for the blessing of another day. And as we pray here together, today, Lord, I pray that we'll focus on you, not the things of the world, that we'll want the things that are eternal and not the things that are temporary. And that as we go through this day, we'll be more focused on your will for our lives than we are on the things that will last only for a short time. Lord, we give you glory in all things, and we pray that your will be done ultimately to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.